but we had some neighbors that lived across the street from us and they had a little boy the age she was in between the age of my two sons and I never felt that I had the freedom to have that little boy over I could not have put that into words and she and I really clicked and we to this day we call each, each other sisters because she's just awesome and she said I had no idea what was going on over there but I knew I could feel it it was so different when he came home well one day she came over and it was about the time I should have been starting supper and she came and, and sat down and I just loved her company and our kids just got along so well they might as well have been cousins and I I got more and more tense as I was thinking about the the clock. What time yep. does that clock say? And oh my goodness, it's getting closer and closer and he's going to be here any minute and what am I going to do? And trying not to go into a full-fledged panic but yet still enjoy her company. I mean, I was just ripped in two. Yeah. And sure enough, he came home before she and, and her son had left. And we talked about it, of course, years later after I had left him. And she said, you know, I can remember that because she said it totally changed the tone in the room, totally changed everything. And it was, he wanted to make sure she knew that she was not welcome to come over, just, you know casually come over and just visit for a while mm -mm. exactly he was not going to allow that and she was not going to stay for supper because this was his home his castle his kingdom and she was not going to intrude yep exactly mm. and you know everybody in the room can sense when things like that happen they can so i had freedom to open the front door but at the same time, I didn't have freedom to have friends over, if that right. makes sense. It makes complete sense. There was parameters on how far you could go with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last line I want to read from this. Yes, absolutely. Eventually, awareness of how dependent they are on the group and gratitude for the smallest attention contributes to an increasing sense of shame and degradation on the part of the members who begin to abuse themselves with litanies of self-blame. No matter what they do to me, I deserve it. I deserve no better. I have no rights. I should be grateful for everything I receive, even punishment. Yeah, because does, like, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, how does that resonate with you? It does. Because like, because I let her in and because I let her stay too late and because supper was not on the table hot and ready and a perfect temperature when he walked in the door i got it mm -hmm. i was in trouble mm -hmm. yes yeah and i think we've talked about it before where it had to be the exact temperature that's where it was this thing like i forget the the verbiage that you use but it um it was one thing one day and another thing another so we will wanted change every day Yes, yes. So mm -hmm. it was it was hot, but one time it was steamy hot, and he'd do this just to you know put me down. You wanted it hot. It's hot. Sit there and chill out. Pull up your big boy underwear and just wait until it cools off and you can eat it. Right. What is the big deal? You know. So yeah, right. it was never. I never satisfied in that re regard, right. and he didn't want me to. He wanted to hold that over me. Now I see that, but I didn't right. then. Sure, you wouldn't have. So when that psychological warfare is going on, you know how many times I've heard a resident come into our shelter and say, well, I deserved it. Mm. I, I, I was mouthy, I deserved it. Or I knew what he wanted and I wouldn't do it, you know, or whatever mm -hmm. else. And so there was that whole, I'm totally reliant on this one person. Nothing else outside of me exists anymore i'm 100 percent dependent on this person and if i'm not satisfying this person then i'm not worthy of anything i'm i'm you know again what this says is little litanies of self-blame i should be grateful when there's food on the table because he's the one that work, works the job and if i 
use too much gas in the car and now there's not enough money to buy a meal tonight that's my fault like it's not his fault you know what i mean mm -hmm. and those are the kind of things that when that psychological garbage for lack of a better term yeah gets in your brain that's, that's the place it. most people yeah that's exactly where i was because it was my fault because i let her in the door mm. and it was my fault that supper was not done on time it was my fault like why didn't i just say hey you want to come in the kitchen while i start supper no right. i didn't have you know i'm frozen literally trying to make my mind up what do i do and i can't think because i'm trying to enjoy her company that should mm -hmm. never be anything that i should have to compromise no no but, it should not but i did i blamed it on myself and then get this in a non-abusive relationship here's a thought for you it's possible but the husband would come home and say oh you enjoy your visit i'm gonna start dinner oh no or you enjoy your visit i'll go pick up something and would your friend like to stay that's how a non-abusive relationship could work that's just like you just blew my mind <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no no that didn't happen. Yeah. I don't know if I've told you, but he didn't even know how to make a can of soup. Oh, my. Literally, every time he'd get hungry for a certain kind of soup, and he'd say, I think I'm going to go make a can of soup. So he and I would think, well, fantastic. I don't have to feed him, <laughs> you know. So he'd go out there, he'd get that can of soup, hold it in his hand, and he'd say, now, how do I make this? I finally got so disgusted telling him over and over again. I finally said, it's on the label. Read the directions. It clearly starts with the word directions and a colon. And then follow the directions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he, But he would still manipulate me to the point that I would have to tell him, okay, so you take the soup and you empty it into the pan. Then you fill the can up with water and you empty that into the pan. Now you turn the heat on medium and you stand there and you stir it. And while it's heating up, you go get a bowl or a mug and a spoon and you have it ready for when it's, it's ready. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's I would crazy. Still let him manipulate I mean, me. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. He did the same thing with making orange juice, frozen orange juice. He didn't know how to do it. Yeah. So no, the fact of him going out and starting supper, no. <laughs> Can't even imagine. <laughs> right. It's yeah. never going to happen. No, no, no. Let's go on to the second one. The second um, piece of coercion, monopolization of perception. Those are big words. Monopolization of perception, meaning... What you're going to perceive, I'm going to tell you, basically. But here's the effects of that. Fixes attention upon the immediate predicament, fosters introspection. These are big words. Eliminates stimuli competing with those controlled by the captor. Frustrates all actions not consistent with compliance. What are the variants? What does that look like? Physical isolation, which we've already talked about. Darkness or bright light. Barren environment, restricted movement, monotonous food. So, you know, if you're a prisoner of war, extreme light in the nighttime, you're, they're monopolizing what you're allowed to see, what you're allowed to hear, what you're allowed to touch, what you're allowed to taste. All those things that are for our, our senses, that's the way that we perceive things. So your captive captor has complete control over that and only lets you see, hear, taste, touch, whatever they tell you, you can see, hear, taste, touch. That's if you're a prisoner of war. Right. There could be too much stimulus in the environment. You've seen situations where someone's in, it's in the middle of the night and the lights are bright and there's loud music playing and you can't hardly even focus. You can't think anymore because of this over stimuli that's going on. The converse is true. It's completely dark and there's no sound and you're just in the black. Mm. The same thing the same effects happen, you know, to the way that you perceive your environment and it wears and tears you down. Definitely. Yeah. So how do you think that looks in an abusive relationship? Very, very similar. Um, I'm going to read from that 
next column over there blames the victim for the abuse, which I'll just stop right there and say that just reinforces what you're already thinking or what I was already thinking. Uh Um, And that's often reinforced by social and familial or family response. I didn't really have that because I really didn't have much in the way of, yeah, those kinds of interactions. Yeah, that didn't really, that doesn't really pertain to what I lived through. Um, Victims become focused on how they caused the abuse and their own weaknesses. And we just talked about that. Um, Yeah, my weaknesses were, they were magnified and they were, you know, put up on the screen for the kids and I'd all ruminate over forever and constantly. Mm -hmm. Um, Unpredictable behavior, definitely. Now, his behavior was, he was always... And this is going to sound contradictory, but he was always the same. I finally, towards the end of our marriage, I accused him of being the tin man. <laughs> I said, because you have no heart. Mm-hmm. And I said, every motion you have is very boring and methodical. And I can outguess what you're going to do next. Yet at the same time, he had unpredictable behavior. And it was mainly his words that were unpredictable and what he required. That was the part that was unpredictable that always kept me hopping. It was just like, I could never stand on both feet. You know, I I could, I always had to be hopping and jumping around trying to figure out what I was supposed to do next. And then fulfilling his latest dictates and, and whatever. Yeah. Wear you out. Mm -hmm. Literally it will wear you out. Mm -hmm. um constant calling texting or emailing yes Mm -hmm. he constantly called when he got a job out of town he would call three and four times a day hi how you doing i'm fine how are you (laughs) (laughs) same as i was two hours ago (laughs) yes exactly and why are you calling Oh, I just wanted to check on you. I love you and the kids. Just wanted to see how things were going. They're fine. <laughs> you know? right. um, at, at that point, I did not have a cell phone. So there was no text messaging or emailing. Let me ask you about that. What happened if you didn't answer the phone? Oh, what I if you and the kids went on a surprise treat to get ice cream and you didn't answer the phone? Why did I do that? How come you didn't? How, what kind of money did you use to go do that? Don't you realize that's a waste of gas? Don't be surprised if you run out of gas before payday comes again. I mean, it was, it would be, and I would take it. I would take it on my shoulders, you know, and, uh, or if we didn't go and actually buy something, but we decided to go for a drive, a short drive, you know, then it, oh man, I would get it. I would be in so much trouble. Now, there was, he never physically abused me. He physically abused the kids and the dog, but he never physically abused me. But I got it emotionally. Mm -hmm. I got it verbally. Mm -hmm. And it was the weight of that is heavier than any massive tree trunk or boulder you could try to lift. And it it continued to pound me into the ground, like taking a a hammer and trying to pound something into the ground. I just got further and further and further uh, bowed down and just beaten up inside. see if there's anything in this article that yeah i'm not enjoying this article very much (laughs) (laughs) okay (laughs) well i mean this this article that kind of goes along with it is talking about people that um 
it's some it's talking about cults and some different things like that. It's not necessarily talking about prisoners of war. And so it's not applying, but it is in some respects. Like this, here's an interesting statement. Um, abusive groups insist on compliance with trivial demands related to all facets of life, food, clothing, money, household arrangements, children, conversation. They monitor appearances, criticize language. They insist on precise schedules and routines, but then they may change on the day to day. They may be, in, or the moment to moment, depending on the whims of the group leaders. Same thing that we're just talking about in an abusive relationship. At first, new members may think these expectations are unreasonable. Mm -hmm. And they may dispute them, but later, either because they want to be at peace or because they are afraid, they they comply. Mm -hmm. And so, again, this is talking about groups of people in cults, but it's, it's not talking about abusive relationships. It's explaining how this chart of coercion doesn't necessarily have to apply to prisoners of war. Cults use the same tactics. They do. Abusers use the same tactics. And so mm -hmm. that's why some of these things in this article might not necessarily go along with it. But... Um, that one did well and everything he becomes use... important in terms of how the group or its leaders will respond and the members desires feelings and ideas become significant it's all about pleasing mm -hmm. the leader the captor the abuser i'm sorry i think i interrupted you no 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 you're fine he would use um the bible and our beliefs of the bible i mean just straight from the bible and he mm -hmm. would use it to pound me out over the head with different mm -hmm. things. So it wasn't that we were part of a cult, but it was, yeah, it made it really difficult. One thing that I really love about Natalie Hoffman, listening to her, she's able to take that and break it down. And, and it took her, she had to go for like a couple of years without even cracking open the Bible. Now she was still walking with the Lord. Okay. She still loved the Lord. Mm -hmm. But she just, she couldn't read the Bible for a couple of years because it had been used as a, a pound. As a stick against to, her. Yeah, absolutely. It had been yeah. used like a, like a billy club over yeah. the head. And she had to just get away from that for a while and just relook at things. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And that makes complete sense. Yeah. Let me see here. Okay, I think we're done with that, unless you had anything else to say about that one. No, I'm good. Okay, number three, induce stability and exhaustion. The goal here is to weaken mental and physical ability to resist. What could that look like? Semi-starvation, exposure to the elements, exploitation of wounds. If you're injured, I'm going to keep pushing on the injury. Induced illness, sleep deprivation, prolonged interrogation, forced writing, overexertion. That's what it looks like if you're a prisoner of war. And I don't know if you remember a story years, well, when we very first started recording and we were going through the power and control wheel and we were talking about physical abuse. And I told you the story of one of the women, I, one of the very first women I ever worked with at the crisis center, who was a lunch lady. Do you remember that story? She had to go to bed really early in the evening yes. because she had to get up super early in the morning. And it was not uncommon for her abuser, sometime after midnight, walk in the bedroom, flip on the lights. So we've got that monopolization of perception. You went from a deep, dark room sleeping in a deep, deep sleep in a dark room to bright lights, kicking her out of bed and starts screaming, yell at her. And the whole focus for that was to keep her in a constant state of sleep de deprivation. Because when you're sleep deprived, you're a lot easier to control, mm -hmm. which is what captors found out with their POWs. Mm -hmm. But then we also see that happening in homes where abusive relationships take relationships take place as well. And I've had a couple of ladies that I've heard their stories of that basic kind of a thing. One man mm -hmm. used to, <coughs> excuse me, she. She had a nighttime job, I think it would overnight or something like that. So he would come in and just plop down on the bed. And of course, then the bed starts shaking and that sort right. of thing. And how do you sleep through that? And he did yeah. it on purpose. And that's mm -hmm. the way he always would sit down and, and uh, start to get dressed, you know, putting his socks and shoes on and whatever. 
can't you go sit in a chair in the living room and put on your socks? Right. You know, can't you, we only have boys here in the home. Can't you take your pants out there, put them on after you put on your socks, get your shoes on out there. I mean, right. It was just insane. Totally thoughtless, totally uncaring about the other person. Mm -hmm. It was Both, purposeful. Yes, it was. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Another. And so that's what we need to keep remembering. When we're talking about this domestic violence is purposeful. Mm -hmm. The way that you treat your captor is also purposeful. You're you're attempting to accomplish something, mm -hmm. and so you know all of these tactics that the captors are using to get what they want from the victims, the prisoners. Same thing in in a domestic violence relationship. Did you want to address the domestic violence side of that one? I do. So I, I this thing about semi-starvation exposure, there was a friend of mine who had her grandchildren that were just in a horrible situation. And these boys one night were all put outside to survive somehow. And so the oldest one, there was about, I don't remember how many years in between, maybe seven to 10 years in between the oldest to the youngest. And so the oldest one took the little two-year-old under his wings, two or three years old. And so what they did was they went and hid underneath a trampoline. So they had at least some sort of covering over them to kind of hide from the parents because they were both abusive to the kids. And that that's what, that's one thing that I think of right away. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just looking at, I'm still under the prisoner of war. Well, the prolonged interrogation for me, and I know I'm not over on the domestic violence side yet, but mm -hmm. we would have uh, supposed um, date nights. I had said, I thought it would help if we had regular time every week or two just to go out, just the two of us. Well, then that turned into a power and control thing. And it was no longer any fun anymore. It was nothing like what it was supposed to be. And I can remember over and over, week after week after week after week, and he would bring up the same things. And I wouldn't even let me respond. And it would be this list of, I mean, he would just shoot it off like bullets from a rapid fire, you know, and it was a thing of um, easily 20 things all in one conversation. And I couldn't even remember what the first one was at that point right? that he brought up. So I know I've talked to you about this before. Mm -hmm. So then I, I said, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to beat him at this game. So I brought pen and paper, started taking notes. What are you doing? Oh, just keep talking. You're good. And so I was writing down all these things that he was wanting to talk about. So then when I started wanting to talk about him one at a time, well, then that wasn't, you know, it wasn't acceptable at all. And it turned into this ridiculous, it was just like a cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and it made, none of it made any sense. It was all intended to make me like this feeling like I'm going crazy kind of a thing. And it right. was, but it was purposeful. He knew exactly what he was doing. Um, yeah. 100% he knew what he was doing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's the other thing is because you came up with the idea of date night. You thought it sounded like fun. You thought it sounded like a good thing. Well, he doesn't want to do that because it was your idea. Mm -hmm. And so why would he want to do something that was special to you? Right. So he was going to just, that was never going to fly. He was going to make sure that it was miserable from the start. Good point. Good point. Never, you could never make, how do you say that? Never make reason out of unreasonable behavior. <laughs> there you, you go. never yes. will because it's <laughs> yeah. unreasonable. Exactly. You can't do it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, um, so over on the domestic violence side, assaults to body image. Oh yeah. And he didn't do it all the time. He did it often enough that it would just cut me to the core. And he knew how to, it may not even be a complete sentence, but it would just slice through me and wound me so deeply. I can remember one time we were walking along and um, 
he made a comment later that night. There was a bunch of us walking together somewhere. And at one point he had gotten behind me and he made a comment that night about getting a little hippie, aren't we? I mean, but then he would turn around and say, you were the most beautiful woman in the room. I only had eyes for you kind of a thing. And I'm like, I wanted to, <laughs> okay, I'm going to be a little crude here, but I wanted to just literally stick my finger down my throat and make myself throw up at that. It's like, mm -hmm. really? Really? So which is it? You're speaking out of both sides of your mouth. So what's the truth here? Which one did you believe? Oh, I believed the insult. Mm -hmm. There's no way I was going to believe it. And, yeah. And then the more he said, you know, how beautiful I was, and I was the most beautiful person, beautiful woman at church, or most beautiful woman in the whatever, wherever we were, you know, and I finally said, would you just stop saying that stuff? Because I know you're lying to me. Well, no, I'm not. You are. You're beautiful. Really? Then what about this comment and that comment? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, well, then you're not really telling me the truth. Right. He didn't undo those statements. No, he did not. Yeah. Mm -mm. And that was purposeful, too. See, I mean, that's the thing that happens with emotional abuse is so you're talking about abuser. We talk about the fact that the rules change every day. So the expectations change every day. The way that they treat you changes every day. So to get to your core, I'm going to say something that degrades you. Mm -hmm. But to make sure that you stay where I want you to stay, where I have the ultimate power, occasionally I'm going to throw you a bone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and keep you in this constant state of confusion. But what your mind clings to are the negative messages. And so that one, one negative message is not going to be outdone by five compliments. No. Even if the five compliments are regarding the negative message and trying to undo the damage that was done with that, that's not the way that works. Mm -mm. So unfortunately what happens then is the one, the negative message, the five comments around it only solidify the negative message mm -hmm. because you don't believe them. You can't believe them when they say that. No. Because again, the rules change every day. The thoughts change every day. The expectations change every day. If you're beautiful today, you're horrible tomorrow. You're, you might be smart today because it serves my purposes to tell you that you're smart. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow you're the biggest idiot I know because that serves my purposes. Mm -hmm. And so the hard part is, is there's no truth in any of it. Thank and you, you. want to make yourself crazy, try to make sense of it. Try to find truth in all of that. And the reality mm -hmm. is the classic tendency of an abuser is they lie all the time so there is no such yeah. thing as being able to back up the words with actions for example because it was a lie to begin with mm -hmm. and so the only thing they do to dig out of the lie is to build a bigger lie mm -hmm. yeah i can remember one person that uh we did a I don't want to get into the whole long story of it, but we knew a couple who had helped us out with a couple things where it was a kind of, I wouldn't even want to call it a side business, but a kind of like a self-employed thing that we had, we tried for a couple of years. And so we were over at a friend's house and they were trying to get us set up with something. I don't remember what it was. We were talking and the man made one comment that I still remember to this day. And I'll bet you that was probably 35 years ago. And I still remember it. He said, he made some comment. He was looking at me and he said, you're the brains of this outfit. Biggest compliment I ever got mm -hmm. because you were just saying, you know, how one day you're smart and the other day you're the stupidest mm -hmm. person I've ever met. I don't remember him ever saying I was smart. Mm -hmm in over 20 years together. I hadn't thought about that until you just said it. What was the consequence to the fact that that gentleman said that to you? He didn't say a word and he never mentioned it to me. Really? I th uh, yeah, I think this is just me. Could be that he didn't hear it, but I think he did. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he just didn't want to face up to that, that his wife was smarter than he was and somebody else had figured it out. And had seen through all of that. 
that he yeah. hadn't pulled the wool over everybody's eyes like he thought. Yeah. Interesting. It was. It really was. I was just, it just came to my mind recently. And I thought, yeah, I remember that. That was really. And that that did so much to build me up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it because at that point, you know, we had uh, shucks. We would have been married about 10, 12 years, something like that. And so I had, I was pretty well beaten into the ground. Sure. And it was an unsolicited compliment. And so was, there what? was, it was an unsolicited compliment. Yes. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, there was no gain for that, that gentleman to say that to you. Mm -hmm. He just said it because he thought it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was one of those kind of things where you could receive it and be like, well, somebody thinks I have a brain in my head. Right. And he and Craig. Of course, of course you would clean it back. Exactly. Well, he and, and my ex got along pretty well mm -hmm. and then his wife and myself were good friends and so it was one of those mm -hmm. rare blends where we could yeah. uh we could go or have each other over at, at the other person's house or whatever right. and yeah so it was a it was really amazing to hear that hmm. yeah really was anyway let me bounce back to this restricts <laughs> finances for food and other necessities we've talked about that about yeah. the uh financial abuse and how it was with us right um and that was another reason he didn't want me to work outside the house he wanted to keep it like that so i was totally dependent on him again there we go back to the island we were on right. an island all to ourselves the children were the byproduct of us being there together, and that was it. And I had to just make do with what he brought home. Um, withholds access to medical care. I don't remember that happening. I will say there was one point, and I don't know if I've shared this or not, but we had gone to a mall, and here we had a toddler who was not even three yeah she she wouldn't have even been three and then we had a newborn that was maybe i don't even know if he was six weeks old and we needed in order to get to our car i needed to ride i think it was up maybe it was down the escalator it doesn't matter and he had one more store that he wanted to go into and so here I am trying to hold this massive diaper bag that's weighs more than the baby does and is bigger than the baby. And because you can't expect him to carry the diaper bag, you know. And so right. he leaves me to go on out to the car with the two kids. So I've got this massive diaper bag, a newborn that I'm trying to carry, you know, and hold tightly on this escalator and the toddler. Well, she slipped out of my hand and reached down and she put her fingers down oh. into the yes put her fingers down into um where the mechanics go mm -hmm. and it hurt her finger and she pulled it mm -hmm. out it was just as black as this microphone with grease mm -hmm. and oil and i don't remember how we knew that she was really hurt i don't remember if she was crying a lot or not it seemed to be she was pretty quiet i don't remember for sure and we got, he finally came out to the car. I was not happy. I was one angry mama. I was like an angry mama bear. And he said, well, he said, you know, you can, you can drop me off at home and then you can take her onto the doctor. And it was one of those rare instances where I stood up. I said, no, I'm not taking her to the doctor. You are, because this is your fault. If we had stayed together as a family and gone back out to the car together as a family, this would never have happened because there would have been one parent for each child. You are dropping the baby and I home and you are taking our daughter to the doctor and you are going to sit there while the doctor takes care of her. He did not argue. I was so surprised. 
Yeah, that's and, interesting. Yeah, when he came home from the doctor's office, boy, did I get a story. And I knew it was right. I knew it was true. He was shook up. He said, she, she, was, she was telling me step by step what the doctor had to do to treat our daughter and to get rid of all that, that grease and oil on her hands before she could even see what was wrong with her. And she still bears those scars today as an wow. adult. Yeah. yeah. From that, from that escalator. So that would be probably the only time I could think of where he withheld access to medical care, kind of mm -hmm. it, not quite right. to that degree, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, disrupts meals and sleep patterns with physical and verbal assaults. Um, no, he disrupted meals by just causing chaos while we ate. Yeah. verbal chaos emotional chaos so that it made it hard to um hard to you knew that nobody was really digesting their food very well right and you knew it affected the kids and it wasn't like he was ranting and raving he wasn't yelling that's one thing that's what i mean by he was always the same he never changed is that he was he was always consistent like this no 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 raging no yelling no throwing things nothing like that and so because he wasn't like that in his mind he was not abusive right yeah sure i'm sure that that's how he explained that oh but it's almost it's almost um scarier for lack of a better term that he could be as manipulative and cold and calculating as he was but basically never changing the expression on his face Right. I mean, that's it's so purposeful, but it's so regimented and intentional mm -hmm. to just not even change, almost to be monotone and everything. Yeah, exactly. And yet... It's not normal. I mean, it's not normal to do that either. It's not normal to live your life like that. No, it's not. It's really not. And we were talking off camera before we started recording about the podcast that I'm listening to about true crime. And the mm -hmm. psychologist is doing such a beautiful job of breaking down and not really anal analyzing because he's, he clearly says, I can't analyze unless I, I interview them, I talk to them, I observe them, that kind of thing. But he said, he talks about like the, the psychopath and the sociopath, for instance. Mm -hmm. and And I don't have a diagnosis and I'm not trying to diagnose my ex but he falls somewhere between those two categories there are many different uh, aspects of both that he falls into oh yeah he was definitely like that the psychopath I've been listening to today um, he really sounds like a lot like the psychopath he was talking about today Mm -hmm. where there's no affect whatsoever when he talks behaves blah 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 mm -hmm. you know and there's no um he was talking today about how they don't they can't recognize emotion they can't recognize fear for instance in somebody else's face and they don't show fear well he didn't either he didn't show fear and yeah. he could he could handle crises very he handled them really well but it's because he he really didn't grasp that, I don't think. Right. Yeah. There was no emotional response to it. No. Yeah. No. Nothing in on his face, nothing in his in his intonations, anything, nothing like that. Thank you for your feedback as well. I appreciate your willingness to share parts of your story tonight. That was very helpful. Absolutely. Folks, remember that no matter where you are in this process, you're always free to soar. Thank you.